Well, hello, I'm uh, George Van Den Abiel. I'm the Dean of the School of Humanities at UC Irvine, and I'm here today with Professor Catherine Malabou, who is the 2015 Wellick Library uh, Lecture Speaker, and uh, we just want to have a little conversation about your talk and where your research is going and um, how you are at the point you're at. So the, um, the lectures are on the topic Metamorphoses of Intelligence uh, and they, uh, if I can say so, really cross between psychology, psychoanalysis, neuroscience, and philosophy. So perhaps I can presume to ask you a little bit how you imagine that kind of bridging disciplines which um, traditionally don't talk to each other at all. And, and certainly, um, I remember being trained in France and distinguishing between psychoanalysis and psychology was key. I mean, it was like you know, not possible to imagine them. And I think you are enabling us to think differently, so. Yes, I had the same experience in, as a student. Like, the, these disciplines were totally separated and psychoanalysis was presented as something superior to psychology mm -hmm. because of uh, its refusal uh, of the biological. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was presented as a great progress that Freud oh. displaced uh, his uh, topics from mm -hmm. uh, his initial neurobiological mm -hmm. work. And so I was raised in that culture of uh, the separation between what I call the symbolic and the biological. Mm -hmm. And then, many years after, when I started to get interested in neurobiology and in the um, uh, brains, ar brains architecture mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. then I discovered some, that uh, this opposition we were just talking about had to be deconstructed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that, for example, Derrida's deconstruction didn't go far enough um, because it never touched the privilege of psychoanalysis or philosophy mm -hmm. over psychology yeah, or neurobiology. Mm -hmm. So, in a, in a way, what I'm doing is, is a radicalization of deconstruction, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I touch on some regions that deconstruction hasn't uh, explored. Has traditionally ignored or ignored. avoided. Yeah. For example, in, in his yeah. talk with yeah. Elisabeth Rodinescu, exactly. de, de quoi de mort, yeah. it says no, um, well, neurobiology is techno-science, etc. Right. Right. So I'm trying to deconstruct that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because it is established as a, a field of knowledge nonetheless, and therefore has assumptions and of course. presuppositions like any other yes. discipline. And yes, and uh, these presuppositions are considered in continental philosophy as reductionist mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. reductive. And uh, on the contrary, I think that it is quite possible to explore the brain and to refuse to make any difference between the mind and the brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it is quite possible to do it without being reductionist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, one of the key uh, principles that, that I find in your work very exciting in terms of addressing that uh, issue is uh, notions of, uh, of course, plasticity, but also you've extended to elasticity, flexibility mm -hmm. of thought and also of the mind and the neuroscientific plasticity as metaphors in other realms. And um, if you could kind of say a little yes. about that. Um, first of all, plasticity, um, I discovered this concept in Hegel, yeah. not at all in neurobiology. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at, at the time already, Hegel um, said, well, what he called plasticity was the mode of being of the subject within the system. Mm -hmm. So as you know, Hegel's, Hegel's philosophy is closure mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. system, and yet it doesn't mean that in this system things are fixed and rigid. On the contrary, they move. They move so right. plasticity designates the kind of mobility within the closed mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found that fascinating because in the brain it is exactly the same problem, mm -hmm. that the nervous system is closed, mm -hmm. and uh, yet at the same time the brain is plastic. It means it has it has its own mobility. Mobility within. Within, uh, and the concept of plasticity also exists in psychoanalysis. Freud mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. in Nietzsche, so in many domains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was fun to explore them. Yeah, no, it, it, it's always interesting. It's interesting to me how you've taken that concept 
um, and that has enabled us to rethink uh, the kind of, on the one hand, dialectic, as it works in Hegel, which is, seems more, you know, oppositional and structured than plasticity within a closed system, um, but also in terms of your advancing, if I can say, advancing the agenda of deconstruction beyond much of Derrida's interest in, you know, Gramme, Trace, uh, differences, those kind of um, areas where always um, what you're calling plasticity mm -hmm. offers a different model that seems yes. less... Yeah. At the end of, um, I think it's March, well, the conference Difference, right. I think it's March in the Philosophy, right. it says in the end that Difference will have to be replaced one day. Yes, yes. Otherwise it would be divine. Yes. But at the same time, I think he never uh, accepted this replacement. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I said that, according to me, plasticity was replacing uh, mm. the trace. Mm -hmm. mm, it created a kind of conflict between us. But oh, this, yeah. is, this is what I think, that uh, plasticity is the new schema, mm -hmm. uh, the, new, the new mode of mobility, of mobility. that comes oh. after writing and, 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 the, and the trace. Right. And alterations and, 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 di and difference always, it seems like there was a move away, I mean when I read Derrida, mm. from difference was spelled with an A, <laughs> which in a sense as a verbal pun does to me suggest already a kind of plasticity. I mean it is, is it temporal, is it spatial, it has a sort of um, kind of semantic mobility if you like, or, or flexibility. Um, but it seemed over time that it was really then reintegrated into um, difference with an E rather than that, that kind of that kind opening of up. I mean, I mean that, that's a, the, the kind of, the, I remember that line about it will have to be replaced as a concept, but mm -hmm. then it seemed like it fell back um, yeah. yes. rather than expanding. So, so um, perhaps because the difference with an A or with an E, mm. uh, is not what it used to be. It used yeah. to be not plastic in its yeah. fundamentality. I mean, everything started with yeah. difference. Right. I think that plasticity um, adds to that, that difference itself is not originary, that changing mm. the capacity of difference, uh, the capacity of difference to change mm. comes prior to difference itself. Nice, yeah. Okay? yeah. So for example, plasticity of stem cells, mm -hmm. The first of all are indifferentiated mm -hmm. and then get differentiated. So mm -hmm. there's something before difference. Right. So, so this modes is also of, what plasticity means. Exactly. The modes of indifferentiation. Yes. As well. So yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, one question that I would like, because we were talking about um, in relation to Jacques Derrida, and uh, we are now, you know, a decade past uh, his um, unfortunate uh, passing. Um, what do you think his legacy is now? How do you see um, deconstruction moving? I mean, you, you have a certain mode of perceiving that. Yes. Um, according to me, deconstruction as a method and as an ontology as mm. well um, is going on. Mm. But it has to be radicalized, as I said. It has to touch regions that Derrida did not mm -hmm. touch, mm. and particularly science, and particularly mathematics, physics, and biology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To me, the problem uh, with Derrida in the end was that uh, deconstruction was too much about literature, mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. poetry. Mm -hmm. I think he, something like um, a closure happened, yeah. like, you know, that... Almost implicitly. Uh, almost implicitly. Yeah. And that um, science in general was considered techno-science, right. as I said yesterday, yeah. Yeah. Uh, pr program, uh, cybernetics, etc. Mm. For example, in, in a text like Faith and Knowledge, it is yes, very clear. Yeah, yeah. And so, we have to deconstruct that resistance of deconstruction mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. certain mm -hmm. uh, fields. Mm -hmm. Of course, it will have effects on deconstruction itself. Yeah, mm? indeed. It indeed. means that perhaps the Derridians won't recognize it. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, so this is a risk unrecognizable I'm, to itself. Yeah, this yeah. is a, a risk I'm yeah. uh, ready to to take. Uh, but that I think perhaps when you when you push deconstruction to to these uh, when you 
put it, when you translate it yeah. into these fields, perhaps it doesn't look like it used to. No, it will it will look different. Different, because you don't write in the same and, way. And I would suspect it would create some of the same resistances and um, challenges that happened with actually deconstruction early on, even even within philosophy. I mean, certainly when I think of American yes. logical philosophy, yeah. which mm -hmm. is always pushed back on that, um, or even within um, the humanities in general, yes. uh, both in this country and in France and in Europe. And so there's been um, that. So ex moving into Sciences, I think I can't imagine a more important agenda to overcome the sort of current um, uh, discursive opposition between the sciences and the humanities. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. as if that were not part of mm -hmm. a, you know, common if highly differentiated or even undifferentiated um, uh, interest and concern with forms of knowledge with, you know, a kind of ontology, epistemology, and these fundamental yeah. concerns. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it was, um, this is um, one reason for Badiou's success, mm -hmm. that he talked about mathematics, and yes. all of a sudden it, it created a kind of uh, relief in people. Yeah, no, it's interesting, uh, um, because, uh, you know, uh, Jean Piaget was mentioned yeah. in yesterday's discussion, and um, I, know I was, I was uh, recently working on um, kind of early development of structuralism and of course uh, one of the key early systematic treatment of that notion of structuralism was Piaget's Cossège volume which has not been read but for him everything comes out of mathematics I mean it's basically forms of Boolean algebra that then can lead into linguistic analysis and then into the other cultural fields with which forms of structuralism and then their further derivations were associated. Um, so this is kind of an interesting return, yes. not just yes. to Piaget and psychology, which was also an outcast, and, but also that he had tried to establish that kind of broad-based understanding of um, perhaps what we now call, I think perhaps to easily critical theory in this country. Yes, and um, also to go back to Derrida, mm. if we remember well enough grammatology, mm -hmm. he presents grammatology as a science. Yes. He yep. says it is an epistemological project. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, grammatology should, should be able to replace general semiology by social. Mm -hmm. And as you know, he wrote the or this preface to the origin of geometry. Yes. So exactly. in the beginning, that was a scientific exactly. project, very exactly. clearly. Yeah. Yeah. And then it disappeared. Mm. So this is a question. Yeah. Well, uh, so why did it disappear? I guess that's another. So he came back to that in his uh, discussion. Well, it was during the Lacan conference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, "Well, people reproach me to not having fulfilled the project of this epistemology, but um, I was at the time I was already saying that." I was not working in the traditional with the traditional concept of episteme. Yeah. So he yeah. tried to, yeah. uh, you know, fin as he did, it to fin yes. Yeah. But uh, obviously he gave up yeah. the project. It, it's interesting. You mentioned Lacan that way. Uh, there's a very enlightening moment. I'm trying to remember in, in one of the seminars of Lacan because he was also quite fond of all these what appeared to be mathematical formulas and. Uh, schemas of various kind, and in one of the seminars, in response to a question from um, somebody, I forget who, he says, "Well, you don't think that these are real mathematical formulas?" <laughs> so then that seemed to sort of suggest, "Well, wait, a minute, what is it then? <laughs> I mean, is it of course, yeah. be meant to be a kind of um, very broad epistemology that can interact?" with almost any field of knowledge um, in some way or other, or is it a metaphor that exists within a more limited scope, perhaps associated with the human sciences, mm -hmm. that um, perhaps at, especially in the, the moment in the 60s, gave a sort of 
legitimacy, a kind of scientific error to um, uh, what people were trying to do. Absolutely. I think there was this, uh, this, this dismissal of science happening in French theory, mm -hmm. and that it is, and I think it is a catastrophe. I really think that has been catastrophic. Yeah. Yeah. And so now all the reactions against yeah. mm, Derrida and others yeah. are motivated by that. Yeah, I true. think it's time to. Um, to, to so that was to, to answer your question about what is the uh, future of deconstruction. Right. I think we should go back to this epistemological right. project. So in many ways, the, the the future is in its early. Form, yes. kind of in, I think in, it, uh, yeah. in, in a certain it's sense, deconstru deconstruction has never happened. Right, right. It basically uh, became, yes. which I think he always alluded to, Derrida, and, and, and you know, feared somewhat that mm -hmm. it would become necessarily limited, become a sort of a, a regional science uh, or a regional um, epistemological branch of philosophy or something. And, um, that is almost certainly what happened. And so to try to kind of break that. To break that, so, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, let me ask you about the um, the question of your work on the uh, brain and uh, metaphors of um, brain activity, mental activity, um, because then again, um, you know, the f the flexibility of the mind um, seems to become. Uh, a metaphor for other things, such as political metaphors or um, economic metaphors and kind of forms of, of, of capitalism. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and we live in a world now where um, you kind of have a neoliberal uh, desire for terms like innovation and uh, thinking out of the box. And it sort of almost grabs that thing. And then um, one wonders where does that lead to? Clearly, um if we need to rebuild, in a certain sense, uh, deconstruction, it's because we need a, a, a political critique mm -hmm. of the use of neurobiology by capitalism. Right. Clearly, the uh, privileged metaphor of today's capitalism and management mm -hmm. is the neural architecture, right. uh, which considers every individual as a little um, neuron in a network. Right. And so that everyone has to be flexible, mm -hmm. interchangeable, everyone mm -hmm. has to travel, mm -hmm. etc. And so we need a kind of political uh, critique of that. Yeah. So, uh, like a political critique of what's often called network science. Yes, network science Which. and the uh, confusion between flexibility and plasticity. Yes, it's, it, it's interesting because um, um, I saw the, uh, uh, actually. Uh, uh, a lecture done by someone who claimed to be a network scientist mm -hmm. and they're tracing a great deal of data, so it's all just massive amounts of data. And this was a historical study of artists in Europe uh, roughly between 1500 and 1900 and you know, hundreds and hundreds of people and discovered uh, as if this was a surprising fact that many of them had died in Rome. Um, and uh, so you produced all this data and analysis mm -hmm. to find that, well, um, why did they all die in Rome? Because that's where they were, they were, or they were lived in Rome at some point, because in, certainly in that era in Europe, that was what, to be an artist meant to be trained in Rome in some way, or that was a city that was associated with art and the rest. So it, it almost becomes then, um, answering your own questions mm -hmm. rather than raising new yes, questions. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's what I took yes, away from yeah. it. And, and that's just one example uh, that then, then what is the, the organizational principle behind that? And what are the uh, ways in which um, network flexibility, political flexibility, uh, mental flexibility mm -hmm. become mm -hmm. kind of um, interchangeable paradigms for um, a kind of management culture. Absolutely. And the, the big thing is that uh, there's no center. Mm -hmm. exactly. So the brain, which was used to, well, which was uh, the privileged metaphor of the center, of right. the head, right. Right. Uh, right. is now becoming more systematic. Like there's no exactly. center. That's right. And the brain is everywhere in our body. That's right. And so um, there's no, in, in new management, there's no 
hierarchy. Everything is horizontal. Horizontal management. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 But still following certain specific principles that of course. have hierarchical yes. implications. <laughs> Precisely, these principles are hidden, mm -hmm. and this is what the philosophical political critique I was mentioning should explore. So, um, it reminds me a little of the old La Fontaine fable about the uh, stomach and the limbs. Uh, yes. I don't know if you know that exactly. one. Uh, exactly. You know, the, the, uh, yeah. uh, all the organs in the body uh, are in a dispute about who is the most important one, which is the most important one. And, you know, of course, there's the brain, there's the arms, there's the heart, there's the lungs, uh, and ultimately the stomach is the one that makes the claim that uh, without, without that, not, nothing happens anyway. Um, um, which, you know, as a kind of uh, poetic um, phrasing uh, within, you know, French classicism uh, becomes an interesting kind of inversion of that. So, um, and at a time when 17th century models of body politic were likewise um, the models for forms of uh, political development that one sees certainly in, in Hobbes and Locke and other people. Yeah. Um, but they always had a kind of um, sovereign principle or uh, head or leader and that, so the hierarchy yes, remained yeah. overt even if it led to a democratic yeah, also form. because of the, uh, um, well, the uh, hmm. importance of neurobiology today, which hmm. is a, a kind of a master discipline. Exactly. That yeah. is overpowering all other fields. So it is a kind of dominant discourse. That's right, yeah. exactly. And it becomes unquestioned. Because it and this is also a problem in the humanities that nobody is questioning that. Mm -hmm. So neurobiology is slowly swallowing mm. all disciplines of the humanities, right. and in particular social sciences, right. and no one says anything. Without, it's just no. as I said yesterday, the tortoise, you know, reaction. Yeah. We don't want that. Right. right. But this resistance is not really uh, elaborated. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's right. And conceptually, conceptually elaborated. Yeah. So it, it is. And I, th I think it would then create an isolation in the humanities as, as well as um, not questioning the principles. Um, it's, you know, I think it's, I've, I've seen rare examples of this, again, attempt you're trying to do to move into um, critique of the sciences at level that is uh, unusual because it requires uh, a knowledge of the basic underlying principles of neuroscience and I think um, those tend to remain hidden I believe I mean that there's there's sort of a, 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 the the other field that I would maybe like to ask you about this related that uh, I mean there's kind of a, a soft version of neuroscience mm -hmm. that, that certainly exists in the United States which is called cognitive sciences yes. and cognitive sciences likewise often passes for a kind of, in my view, um, uh, kind of almost, you know, unquestionable common sense and then it leads to you having uh, answers to questions that are already embedded. And so um, there are like, you know, cognitive scientific approaches to reading literature, which then stumbles upon the old question of what a reader is. and, and um, you either hypothesize an ideal reader or you do statistical studies of readers. And these are, I think, these are the worst. Yeah. Uh, cognitivists, cogniticians. I, I prefer um, the neurobiologists. Because you know, yeah. they're because, basing themselves in yeah, something. Because already. these people, they, yeah. they, they're not trained in neurobiology. Most, most of the time they're trained in psychology mm. and they are extremely rigid and they don't want any, they don't accept any philosophical discussion. Um, so they are terrible, most yeah. of them. So it's mostly like empirical based research that... Oh yes, that and yeah, I had a conversation recently with Stanislas de Haine, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, for me philosophy is just, well, well, well it's just, it takes, um, philosophy is just about unresolved questions. Mm -hmm. Once they're resolved, these questions will disappear. Yeah. And we cogniticians will 
um, put yeah. an end to all metaphysical questions because we'll, we'll prove empirically what the self is, what the subject is, what this and that is, you know, yeah. like that. But you can't prove empirically what it is without a pre-existing concept of it. Oh, they don't, I think that's, they don't, that's the philosophical they don't, they question. They don't care about that. Yeah, they don't yeah, care about that. Yeah, yeah. So. But that's why also, like in your talk yesterday, some, a category like intelligence and the basis of IQ tests, then, you know, if, if one doesn't have a um, definitional concept at work, at least, you know, provisionally, then one is making kind of assumptions on notions that are, you know, what are you proving? You're, you're proving a non-entity, actually. I mean, it sounds like intelligence ends up being everything and nothing, and yes. not, not a clearly... Well, they, they would say, no, 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 we're proving uh, where the subconscious is, we're proving what, the, what perception is, we're proving where the sense of the self comes from, etc. They would answer that, that we don't need concepts, that concepts are barriers yeah. against, yeah. against I don't know what. Yeah, but, um, yeah it, 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 it's kind of like a, I, I feel it's kind of return to Locke in a certain sense, oh, yeah. a kind of Lockean epistemology where yeah. uh, one is just a blank slate and things happen to you experientially and, and that produces as if Kant did never exist. And if if uh, you know the Kantian moment is oh, no. the moment of philosophy, well, yeah, no, no, for them, it's yeah, <laughs> that, <laughs> that there have to be any kind of pre, uh, a priori, uh, uh, forms in order to even think these questions. That, that seems to be where the debate lies. So I know you, it kind of ended yesterday with with, yeah, with Kant, yeah, even yeah. though I know you began with Hegel. <laughs> yeah, so. but yes, um, the last book I wrote. So. The translation is almost done now in English. It's about Kant, the transcendental, and the way in which the transcendental has to be rehabilitated today mm -hmm. in order to be to, to, to make that discussion possible mm -hmm. uh, with these people who mm -hmm. deny the existence of something like the transcendental. Mm -hmm. So, can you tell us a bit more about about the, the transcendental? Work? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, there's a trend in philosophy um, currently, which is speculative realism. Mm -hmm. And you have this book by Meyasu called After Finitude, right. in which he says we have to relinquish the transcendental. Mm -hmm. So post-critical philosophy is a philosophy without the transcendental. Because according to him, the transcendental always pertains to what he calls correlationism, that is the subject-object relationship. Mm -hmm. And he says we're not able to, because of Kant, to get rid of that relation. And in that sense, he's very close to the scientists we're yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. That the transcendental is just a metaphysical mode of naming the subject-object mm -hmm, mm -hmm. relationship. So I try to argue, I, I, I try, because the book is very interesting, mm -hmm. uh, very strong, and so I try to show that the transcendental was not at all this correlationist structure, that mm. it was something else. Yeah, no, huh? that's... Uh, you know, so and, 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 and certainly not just in, in Kantian philosophy, but also in, in phenomenology. Yes. Merleau-Ponty, like as a, the, the function of the transcendental categories, is that you... Uh, the, the argument it, it, is it, that... It, it assumes that otherwise we're back into these closed discussions. There's, there's always something outside of one's that, which is key to deconstruction, too. Mm -hmm. so. The argument is that the transcendental is supposed to guarantee in Kant the necessity of nature. Mm -hmm. But in fact, according to Mayer, who Kant is not able to deduce the transcendental. So in mm -hmm. fact, he hides a kind of total contingency behind this so-called uh, necessary right, right. transcendentalism. But in fact, he's not able to prove it. Right, right. right. So it's just a decree, you know, like. Uh, so then it, 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 but it comes back then to, uh, you know, you know what I would call basic philosophical questioning of what presuppositions are. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that, that uh, one simply doesn't proceed without something presupposed um, within almost any discourse or thought. You know. yeah. For them, the presupposition is that everything is contingent. Yeah, that's right. Required. So just a a a contingent and empirical. So there's, Absolutely. Yeah. But then you can't explain the metamorphoses <laughs> <laughs> of intelligence, among so. other things. But yeah. it was fun to, to, to yeah. do that kind yeah. of reactualization yeah. of the transcendental. Excellent. It was fun. I'll Excellent. send you the book. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Would you like me to say a word about the concluding lectures? Of course. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Oh. Yeah. If, if I have to say. Yeah. If you want to say a couple words more about my lectures. Yeah. Well, we are in the next two. Okay. So uh, tonight we'll be in the um, epigenetic term. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the. Um, obsolescence of the genetic paradigm mm -hmm. and uh, what is happening now in biology with epigenetics and uh, uh, the new vision of the brain that it entails mm -hmm. because uh, the brain's development is e practically entirely epigenetic yeah that's right Maybe. so i'll talk about that excellent and also on the same line the development of artificial intelligence which also follows a kind of epigenetic line mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i'll do that tonight excellent excellent so and tomorrow I'll try to conclude in bringing back the people in the tortoise, like uh -huh, their dad. Okay. I try to make a synthesis of the, uh, the philosophical yes. react, yeah. Like, yeah. You know, reaction. How can we use to get the philosophical concepts right. in order to to think through that? Yeah, to think through that, and not to, to just do a critique or right. a rejection, but also. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, to kind of yeah, a, a deconstruction where you're working through, and then opening up other possibilities. Exactly. And and, and also un revealing the presuppositions and implications that exactly. are not necessarily obvious in the way it's been put together. So this is the move, the move, the general movement. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, you. You, thank you. Thank for you for your questions. It was very nice. Very interesting.